Today is the 123rd anniversary of the Eiffel Tower. This is a building that has special significance for me. I was born in France, and when I grew up, uh, or growing up, my parents had an assortment of little Eiffel Tower figurines, they had photos, they had this really gaudy, oversized t-shirt, and it would just, it reminded me of that part of my heritage. In 1889, when it opened, it was the world's tallest building, and that was a title that it held for around 40 years. There are 18,000, over 18,000 pieces of uh, wrought iron and over 2.5 million rivets that went into its construction. It's a marvel of engineering by anybody's imagination, but especially by the imaginations of that particular time in history, because there is no way, it's a hollow structure. You don't have a floor to stand on as you're, you're building up. Um, what some of you may know is that when this marvel of engineering first opened, it was a pathetic joke. The novelist Leon Bloy called it a truly tragic street lamp. Um, there were 300 of Paris's leading citizens who actually paid money to take out a full page advertisement in a newspaper and they wrote an angry letter about this and they called it a giddy, ridiculous tower dominating Paris like a giant black smokestack. They were angry. One of the writers who wrote in that letter is actually my favorite story about the Eiffel Tower. He hated it and they caught him having lunch in the tower's restaurant every single day. Day after day, he would go into this restaurant and he'd have lunch there. And finally, the, the proprietors of the Eiffel Tower said to him, you know, you don't really like the tower. Why are you here every day? And he said, well, this is the one place in Paris I can't see the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> it was supposed to be torn down 20 years after it was built. And it proved useful for radio transmission, so the city of Paris decided that it would keep it for a little while longer. Some time passed, and then people began to see its aesthetic brilliance. They began to look at the Eiffel Tower the way that we look at the Eiffel Tower, which is something that's a real symbol of how engineering and design and architecture can come together and take wrought iron and turn it into this. I mentioned that I was an immigrant, and one of the things that you struggle with if you're an immigrant is where to claim a history. You don't exactly know wh whose history is your own. So when I was young, I read a lot of history about the Revolutionary War and about the Founding Fathers, and I gotta tell you, I fell pretty hard for these guys. Uh, I loved it, I loved Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill, the whole thing. And I read a lot about the places that they traveled, and lo and behold, they traveled to France. So here was a history I could connect to. One of the people that I became most interested in was John Adams, and his time in France also is the most time that he spent away from the other interesting figure in the Adams pair, which is his wife, Abigail Adams. And the intriguing thing about that partnership is, I, I, it, it has to be, by anybody's estimate, the world's most historically significant long distance relationship. Um, they were uh, prolific writers, and it's a good thing that they didn't have text messaging or Skype because they wrote an inordinate number of letters to one another. Uh, they sometimes took six months to get, so you'd send a letter and it'd take six months if it arrived at all. So each letter was really crafted to make an impact because you didn't know if it was ever, how long it was going to take before you got the next letter. We have 1,200 or so of these letters, uh, and they're in a historical society in Massachusetts, and they constitute probably one of the best archives we have of our country's founding. Today, March 31st, is the anniversary of probably the most significant letter that Abigail Adams ever wrote to John Adams. It was 1776, and John Adams was away at the Continental Congress, you know, just finishing up the Declaration of Independence. She knew that, she knew what was going on. And she wrote to him, and her lines were, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which you will surely have to make, I desire that you remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. 
Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not given to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not uphold ourselves to any laws in which we have no voice or representation. She wrote that 150 years before the women's suffrage movement. If that letter had fallen into the wrong hands, there's no telling the kind of damage that it could have done. But this was the nature of their relationship. They shared everything, public and private, political and not. When he wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, she was his editor. And when Thomas Jefferson attacked him in the press, she wrote a really angry letter to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, she called him in her letters, my dearest friend. And he referred to her as Miss Adorable. It's an incredibly sweet story. And I think it also has a lot to teach us about companionship and about partnership and about marriage, even today. When I was 18, I cast my first vote in the United States. And I could tell you, and I'll spare you, but I could tell you every detail of going to vote for the first time in the United States. And the reason is because I was really conscious of the fact that I was gonna be the first Sony to vote in the United States. And I really didn't wanna screw it up, so I <laughs> prepared in advance and read about all the crazy local elections and everything else. But I was really profoundly moved by the fact that I was gonna be the first person in my family to, to cast a vote in what is the nation's oldest democracy. Today, March 31st, is the anniversary of the first black man voting in the United States. March 30th is when the 15th Amendment was passed, and March 31st, a man named Tom Peterson voted in an election in New Jersey. He's not famous. There's not then and really not now. Uh, there weren't parades in his honor. He doesn't, as far as I know, have any monuments to his name. In fact, the election itself was pretty simple. It was over a, re a revision to the town charter, for or against. He was in the stables working, and the stable owner came out to him and said, hey, you should go and vote. And he's like, okay, maybe I'll do that. When he was walking home, somebody else came up to him and said, hey, you should go and vote. And he said, okay, I'll go and vote. So he voted, not a lot of fanfare. His side won, he voted for. That's about all the detail we have on that vote. In fact, we don't actually have much more than that on him either. He was a school janitor for around seven years. We know that one of his parents was a slave. They think that both of his parents might have been slaves, but they're not sure. Actually, the most revealing thing that we know about him is that he, when, he, uh, when the citizens found out years later that he was the first black man who had voted in the United States, they got really excited. They said, well, we're gonna give you a, a handsome medal and it's gonna be engraved, and he said, okay, but I want you to do a thorough investigation to make sure that I was actually the first black man in the United States to vote. He was, they gave him the medal, he wore it everywhere. He wore it to church on Sundays. And you can actually see the medal in this photo, which is really one of the only ones we have of him. I like this story. I, I think he's one of these extraordinary, ordinary people who helped move this country's history in the direction of justice and who history simply overlooked. One of the messages of our time is that we need to focus on the present, right? You hear this a lot. Self-help books have a lot of this stuff in them. You need to focus on the moment, be in the moment. And yogis and monks will tell you that if you meditate and you do focus on the moment, that you can become more peaceful, more zen, that you might even achieve transcendence. And maybe given how distracted we all are and given the effect that our phones have on us, that's a good thing to talk about. It's a good thing to adhere to. But then that message competes against the other dominant message of our time, which is the future and how much we need to focus on it. Students know this well because you all prepared for your futures 
five years ago so that you were lucky enough to come to Duke. But companies, countries, we all focus on what's around the bend, what's the next technology, what's the next thing that's going to happen, how are we going to make progress for the future. And maybe, given the challenges this, that we face, that's the right place to focus our time and attention. History is not going to help us invent new technology. History is not, as far as I know, going to lead us to transcendence. But I want to sound a note in its favor. I think we can make our present richer, and I think we can make our future brighter if we spend some time returning to our origins, if we figure out who we are, why we are the way we are, and what made us that way. And I have to tell you, I think we need to do it with the same urgency that we do for the present and for the future. We need to rethink how we teach and talk and learn about history. Right now, we teach for tests, not for pleasure. We recite and review facts, not stories. I think we would all be better served if we remember that history is really just one long narrative. That it is a long story involving real people with real faces and real last names like Peterson and Adams. The documentary filmmaker Ken Burns, who I'm sure many of you know, he has a great line that I love. He articulates this the best way I've seen. He says, history has become a kind of castor oil of dry dates and facts and events, something we know is good for us but is horribly tasting. I might be going out on a limb, but I think we can make history taste better. I think we can make it more than just dry, specialized knowledge in dusty textbooks that are virtually inaccessible. I think we can remind people that even in something as simple as the changing of a calendar day from March 30th to March 31st, you can find a rich load of historical significance. I can give you dozens of good reasons to study history. I really can, and you don't want to hear that. For me, the most important reason is this. History can cure us of arrogance. When you start to take history seriously, you realize that no matter how great your triumphs and no matter how bad your failures, they really are not that great, and they're really not that bad you cease to believe in the notion of a self-made man or a self-made woman. The world is too complex and we are too much the product of everything that happened before us for us to ever take credit for it. History is humbling. But it's also empowering. You learn that it's flesh and blood people, just like you, who struggled with things like creativity and failure, love and longing, and courage and commitment. This humanity has been stripped out of our history, and I think it's high time we restore it. And if we do, I think it'll make us more ambitious, and I think it'll make us more gracious. I think it'll make us want to and be willing to strive and work and struggle, but I think it'll also make us more appreciative of the people who strive and worked and struggled before us. So how do you do it? That's the question. How do you make history human again? How do you make it real for people in their daily lives? Start simple. Know your own history. Talk to your grandparents. Visit a historical society. Go to a Civil War battlefield. Read a biography. Learn about the namesake of a building that you walk into every day, or a statue you pass by every day, or a plaque you glance at every day. Find out who the human beings were behind significant events that inspire you. But we're all pressed for time. So let me offer a final suggestion. Tomorrow is a new day. Go find out what happened in it. Thank you.